Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this special meeting of the Berlin Board of Education. It's February 23rd, 2022. We're going to start the meeting with the call to order with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So we have a packed agenda this evening. Um, before we begin, I'm just going to go through some housekeeping items. So this is a special meeting, and typically on a special meeting agenda, we do not have audience a citizen. We made sure that this is on this agenda, and we want to hear everyone speak. If you have not signed up, I have the first sheet right here. Um, there's other sheets up there, and I will be calling from the top, the bottom, top, the bottom. Everyone will get the chance to speak this evening. I know there's been some rumors going around that we are limiting speakers, and there's a whole bunch of stuff that's not true. What is true? Everyone gets two minutes. When the timer goes off, your two minutes is up. Please be respectful of that. Right now, I am going to read you what our board policy is for audience of citizens, so you can see that we are making accommodations to hear everyone because we value your voices. Um, okay. The board may permit any individual or group to address the board concerning any subject that lies within its jurisdiction during a portion of the board's regular meetings, so designated for such purposes. Three minutes may be allotted to each speaker and a maximum of nine minutes per topic, with prerogative of board chairperson to extend that time as appropriate. The board may modify these limitations at the beginning of the meeting if the number of persons wishing to speak makes it advisable to do so. That is why we have changed it from three minutes, three people per topic, nine minutes total, to two minutes. So please respect that. No inappropriate or disrespectful conduct shall be permitted at any Board of Education meeting. Persistence in such conduct shall be grounds for summary termination by the chairperson of that person's privilege of address. All speakers must identify themselves by name and address. So we need to make sure we have a respectful meeting. Look around. There are a lot of kids here. We need to make sure this meeting is run the same way we expect our schools, our classrooms, our professionals to act. So if someone is raising their voice, getting disrespectful, I'm going to ask them to stop. I'm going to ask them to leave. If they don't leave, I'm going to ask the police to escort them out. And then if we have disruption within the auditorium, I'm going to call a recess, clear the room, and we will have to conduct business without members of the community. And it's too bad that I have to state this at the start, but I want to be crystal clear on what the expectations are so everyone has the opportunity to talk and to share what's most important to them. Please be respectful of all opinions, even if you do not agree. The next thing is you have to wear your mask. If you are not wearing your mask during this meeting, you will be asked to do so. If you fail to do so, you will be asked to leave. If you do not leave, the police officer will escort you out. And then again, if you don't put it on, then I'm going to have to call a recess and we're going to have to clear the room. The same thing applies. So I there are children here. We have a student presenting this evening, and we just need to make sure that this is a respectful environment for all, and we are modeling what's expected of our students. So thank you for letting me lay the groundwork. Now I am going to turn it over to our student who is presenting this evening. I am very excited to hear how all about the stock market and why it's a good investment. Good evening, everyone. My name is Eileen Eustace, and I'm the principal at Berlin High School. And as many of you are aware, we have a very robust capstone program in place at our high school. We were actually one of the first high schools in Connecticut that put this program in place going back as far back as 2013 and 14 for all of our graduating students. 
Um, so over time, the program has evolved and we're very, very impressed with the student products and presentations that they have put forth. We've expanded from PowerPoint presentations to uh, students that uh, will do TED Talks, make documentaries, do great presentations, and tonight you're actually going to see a student's uh, development of a website as well. So I really hope that you will enjoy the presentation. I'm sure you will. Um, I would like to introduce Shri Patel, who is going to be doing her presentation on investing in the stock market. Um, Shri is a senior student. She is hoping to study finance in the future. She's waiting on her options right now, and I'm sure she's going to have a very bright future. And I would like to turn it over to Shri, so please be sure to enjoy her presentation this evening. She's a little nervous, so everybody just make sure it's a nice, warm, welcoming environment for her as she is a little nervous tonight. So go ahead, Shri. Hello and good evening. My name is Shri Patel and I am a senior at BHS. Over the past couple of months, I was given the opportunity to research my capstone project. The essential question that I explored for my project is how does the stock market work and why is it a good source of additional income? So I'm Indian, and on top of being Indian, I'm Gujarati. And if there's one thing we're known for, other than food, it's our money-mindedness. <laughs> Gas stations, motels, businesses, crypto stocks, you name it. Because there's no stone left unturned when it comes to making money. Certainly, my family is no exception to this. And I guess it's this mindset that first introduced me to stocks. My interest in stocks first sparked when I heard my dad talking about his GE, General Electric stocks. And at first, I didn't really understand what all the complex numbers and constantly changing colorful charts meant. But I did enjoy my daily updates. The older I got, the more intrigued I grew. And although I do not currently trade stocks, I plan on doing so in the near future. And I'm sure many of you here have jobs. Undoubtedly, you put in the hours and hard work. And when that paycheck comes, it's like, dang, I worked so hard just for this. <laughs> you made bank until you see those nice pair of Jordans or the grocery list. And just like that, your money is gone. But what if you could take that money you make from work and double it, triple it, even quadruple it? You can with stocks. What are stocks? According to the website moneyinstructor.com, a website created for stock market simulations and lesson plans for teachers, if you own a company's stocks, then you're an owner or shareholder of the company. This means that a stock represents a claim on the company's assets and profits. For example, if you have Apple stocks, that means you own a certain percentage of Apple. To calculate your ownership of a company, you have to take the shares you own and divide that by all of the company's stocks. So let's say you have 200 Apple stocks and Apple has, let's say, 10,000 shares. You would divide 200 by 10,000, which would mean that you own 2% of Apple. If you go to the stock app on your phone right now, you will see that Apple stocks closed red today. The phrase, the stock is red or negative, means the stock traded lower than the previous day. Likewise, the stock is green or positive means the stock traded higher than the previous day. This seems great and all, but why would companies sell stocks? Essentially, companies sell stocks to generate money which they use for multiple initiatives from funding new projects to paying down debt. But wait, it gets better. Numerous companies even pay dividends on their stocks on dividend date. Dividends are when a shareholder is paid that percentage of profit, typically quarterly, according to moneyinstructor.com. However, some companies pay dividends monthly. It is important to keep in mind that companies pay dividends if shareholders still have stocks on the ex-dividend date. 
which records your ownership of the number of shares on that date. Take, for example, Apple, whose declared dividend was 73 cents per share on January 29th, 2019. This means with your 200 Apple stocks, you would make $36.50 in four months. In a year, this number would total to $146. According to this graph, Apple has quite the promising history when it comes to dividends since there's a steady increase. Many companies even split their stocks. Emmy-nominated writer Brian Beers, with 15 plus years of experience in corporate finance and accounting, as well as investing, describes a stock split is when a corporate action in which a company increases the number of its outstanding shares by issuing more shares to current shareholders. Stock splits allow affordability for small investors by reducing the price of the stock while the number of overall company stocks increases. Stock splits are done in ratios such as two to one, some to one, etc. So if Apple were to split stocks to a four to one ratio, then your stocks would quadruple and now you would own 800 stocks and the price of the stock is reduced to $43.69. Essentially, your total value of the stocks would remain the same. This image right here depicts what I just said. So you have one stock and ends up splitting into four different stocks. As you can see, the one stock that was worth $150 becomes $37.50. However, it is still worth the same amount of money. Like many investments, stocks come with a risk because there's no guarantee of profits when you buy stocks. If a company doesn't do well or falls out of favor with investors, its stock prices can fall and shareholders could lose money. But rest assured, because stocks can be assessed. In order to calculate the risk associated with a stock, it is important to know how to comprehend a stock market chart. Author Chris Muller, who has an MBA and has written about all things finance since 2019, and even builds and runs a digital marketing agency, supports this by stating, more advanced stock charts will show additional data, and by understanding the basics, you can pull out a lot of information about a stock's historic, current and expected performance. As you may have figured out by now, the stock market is dependent on probability and statistics. Now, to get deeper into the stock market chart, there are many attributes, such as the trend line. The trend line displays the overall growth in stock price over many years where local fluctuations occur due to many different reasons. Muller shows a specific example of the trend lines by mentioning in fact, the trend line should lead you to dig further. For instance, Apple as a company really took off from 2009 to 2012. But what happened from 2012 to 2013? The stock began to sink. At one time, shares were down more than 40%. Drastic changes can help identify potential outcomes for the future. And by associating the stock price to the time period the drastic change happened in, the nature of the stock can be predicted in similar situations. A real life example of a drastic change is when the stock market crashed in 2008. Stocks were significantly lower because housing prices fell and homeowners began to abandon their mortgages. Another crash happened recently in 2020 due to COVID, where stocks were decreasing significantly in a short amount of time. Apple stock prices dropped an entire $80. Support lines and resistant lines also serve a similar purpose. However, they break down the chart even further with support lines representing a low level of stock price reaches over time and is the time where traders most likely buy stocks. An example of this would be line A. Resistance lines represent a high level of stock price reaches over time and is the time where traders most likely sell their stock. An example of this would be lines B and line D. Several trend lines can also be explained by the news, which has a huge impact on the market. As Muller mentions, this is where your trend lines come in handy. News comes and goes, but when news coincides with a dramatic shift in the trend line, it is something important to pay attention to. 
News plays a huge role in stocks because they can influence buyers to sell or purchase stocks and increase or decrease the price of a stock. It is important to not get easily influenced by what is seen in the news because sometimes the news can be fake and you can put yourself at a disadvantage. But keeping up with the news can help you predict the outcome of your stocks. According to Blaine Ryan Kinsmer, a successful stock market investor with 20 plus years of experience in trading states that by casually checking in on the stock market each day and reading headline stories, you will expose yourself to economic trends, third party analysis, and general investing lingo. For example, there's a huge controversy regarding GameStop stocks where some discussion group on Reddit started encouraging others to invest in the company. They spread false info claiming that the big investors were wrong and that GameStop was significantly undervalued. And more investors brought in, causing a rapid rise in the market, so the stock value increased. Large investors lost lots of money and little investors championed their purchases. Another way to reduce the risk associated with stocks is diversification and long-term investments. According to Chad Langager, co-founder of Second Summit Ventures Capital and vice president at Alta ML, states that you could think of it as a financial jargon for don't put all of your eggs in one basket. Diversification is investing in a range of assets which helps reduce the risk of severely hurting the return of your overall investment. If you put all of your money in one company, then the chance of risking your money is higher because if the company stocks decrease, you could lose all of your money in one go. Another useful tip was given by Tony Welby, the director at Saunderson House, in an interview with Times Money Long-Term Investment, is decide what you are investing for when putting money in the stock market. Financial advisors suggest leaving it for at least five years to have the best chance of it appreciating. Stocks gain and lose daily. Small amounts of profit can be earned by trading stocks daily. However, just because a stock is in profit does not mean you need to sell it. Now, if I'm gonna talk about stocks, I have to mention the man himself. Warren Buffett, nicknamed the Oracle of Omaha, who bought his first stock at the young age of 11. Buffett, along with Benjamin Graham, are some of the world's best and most successful stock market investors whose advice is followed by many. At your own leisure, you can click their images, which will take you to a website of some of the Here are some steps you can take to open an account and get your stock market journey started. Be sure to check out this TED-Ed by Oliver Elfenbaum or this video by Clay Trader at your own leisure if you want to learn more about stocks. Here is my works cited page accrediting the numerous sources I use to aid me in this project. I am grateful to have done my capstone project on stocks because I was able to expand my knowledge about a topic I am passionate about. I was able to take away that the agility stocks allow for investors is noteworthy because whether you prefer long-term investment or short-term investment is up to you to monitor, trade, and sell as you please. However, to be on the safer side, it is useful to invest in stocks with dividends since they pay a steady amount of money. Despite the risks that stocks hold, analyzing a stock market chart is a useful skill to possess, and the news can come in handy. Essentially, stocks have a good earning potential and serve as a great investment. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. That was phenomenal. Um, so I really enjoyed watching this. I'm a business education teacher myself, so this was right up my alley. Um, and I, you know, I love how you appropriately cited your sources. You had really great sources and lots of awesome information. You're a senior, correct? Yes, that's correct. Have you decided where you're going to school next year or what you're going for? No, I have not heard back from any of my colleges yet. Okay, I wasn't sure. I know it's still kind of early on. Um, are you thinking of studying business? Yes. Awesome. And wh what business classes at Berlin High have you taken? I've taken business survey, personal finance, accounting one, 
Those are the classes I've taken. Awesome. So that, do you think that helps spark your interest or a little bit of both between school and home? I think it's a majority of it was at home, but I will say that they have um, pushed me to, you know, look more into the stock market, so. That's awesome. Great. I'm going to open it up to the board if anyone has anything they would like to add, but very impressive, especially with making the Google site um, and all the information and your presentation skills. So thank you for coming out tonight. It's a, it's a big meeting, so you did great. Anyone else on the board? Go ahead, Adam. Thank you, Shree, for, for being here this evening. Obviously, everyone's here to learn some stock tips from you. That's why we have such a large audience. Um, I'm sure that when you heard that you were going to be presenting to the Board of Ed, you didn't think you were going to have this many people in the audience as well. But I think it was uh, beneficial for everyone to see the work that our seniors are doing with their capstone project. So thank you for being here. Thank you. I want to say that um, not only was the content phenomenal, and I wish I had gotten this when I was in high school, I wish I knew half of what you know, and your presentation was excellent. No one would ever have known, <laughs> had your principal not told us, that you were nervous. <laughs> it was fantastic. You did a great job. And so thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Anyone else from the board? All right, one more round of applause. That was awesome. I will say having students come out, this is a highlight of the work we do as a Board of Education because we get to see what our students are doing in the schools and all the learning that's happening. So thank you. All right, moving on to uh, committee reports. So I'm gonna turn it over to our student representatives. Yes, yeah, so we have a few updates for you. So first, the BHS Theater and Musical Arts Department will be putting on Into the Woods here in the auditorium on March 3rd uh, through 6th. So tickets are available at singingredcoats.ludos.com. I encourage you all to come check it out. Um, on, February 8th, on February 15th, eighth graders were invited into the school for a tour, which was led by the Upbeat members, to meet future teachers and learn about the possible courses that they could take next year. And sophomores enrolled in our AP US Government and Politics class recently had the chance to visit DC um, this weekend with the organization Close Up. So they visited the monuments and museums, debated with students from other schools, and even explored some DC neighborhoods. And students in grades 8 through 11th are currently in the process of registration, registering for courses for next year. And all course information is available on the BHS website in the Program of Studies. This past weekend, Upbeat held a trip to Mount Snow where students were given the opportunity to snowboard or ski. Um, on March 5th, the pancake breakfast will be held at Berlin High School from 7 to 11 a.m. And if you need to purchase a ticket, any Upbeat member will be very eager to sell one to you. And on March 11th through the 13th, March weekend will be held at Camp Woodstock. And this is a really great opportunity to improve students' leadership and teamwork skills. And finally, for um, as winter athletics are closing, we want to congratulate all winter sports teams. Um, currently, the boys and girls basketball team are preparing for the state competition. Boys hockey has 15 wins, and girls hockey has 13 wins. Indoor track has 10 girls that qualified for states and one qualified for nationals. And the boys swim team is four and one in the CCC South. And finally, wrestling placed third at the Class M Division Tournament with six kids qualifying for the State Open. And that's all we have for tonight. All right. Any questions for our student representatives? All right. Thank you for that report. I do have my tickets for the breakfast, so I'm sorry <coughs> I can't buy extras. But I'm sure there's plenty of people here that would like to buy them. <laughs> um, moving on to committee reports. Do we have any committee reports this evening? Go ahead, Tim. We had, uh, we had an ad hoc committee to review the policies that we're gonna be uh, talking about later on this evening a couple of weeks ago, or it's only about a week ago now. Um, so a lot of legal changes to those policies. There was nothing um, overly concerning. So from a, an ad hoc perspective, we are happy with those policies and certainly we can discuss them later, but that was it. Thank you, Tim. Any other committee reports? Yeah, we had our communication or our community engagement um, committee meeting on the 3rd. And what we did was we reviewed some um, social media policies. So the states, many towns have social media policies. So we brought a bunch of them together. 
uh, reviewed them for a few days, and then we kind of picked apart what we would want, kind of wrote it, and it's now into the lawyers, and they're going to be um, making a mock policy for us, and then we'll take it further for review and votes. Any other committee reports? No, not okay. Not. Correct report? Oh, no, nothing. Nothing to report? Okay, and correspondence to the board? Yes, I have a few here. Dear Brian and Board of Education, thank you very much for the gift card. We are very lucky to have many kind people supporting us during these difficult times. Um, thank you, um, Lori and Tim Oaks. Brian Benigni, Board of Education, thank you for the card and the plant. Jennifer Patlowski, Griswold Food Service. To the Berlin Board of Education and staff, thank you very much for the beautiful plant garden. My mother loved gardening. It was a beautiful tribute to her. Thank you for your thoughtfulness. Jen DeMeo and family. And lastly, um, I want to thank everyone for the beautiful Lily. Your kindness is very appreciated. Linda Delano. Thank you. All right, we're going to move on to the next item, um, the revised reopening plan. <coughs> so we move this ahead of audience of citizens. I know a lot of people want to talk in regards to this. However, with it being a special meeting, with us sending out the email on Friday, um, we just figured we would go ahead and address this first. Um, I only received one email um, in opposition to change, making a change um, and also in regards to any emails that were sent. I did my best to respond to all the emails on behalf of the board. I do want to let you know that my whole family has been sick for over three weeks and it you know, was a long three weeks. So um, in addition to my full-time job and my graduate studies and my part-time job, um, I, I really did do my best trying to get back to everyone. So I apologize if I did not respond to an email. Uh, that was not my intention. So I just want to state that. And I will state that again when we move into audience of citizens. But um, so I'm going to turn it over to Superintendent Benigni to discuss um, the revisions that have been made to our school opening plan. And then after we um, just, he shares, we will entertain a motion. We will have discussion amongst the board and then we'll have a vote. So I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, Julia. So at this time, you've seen now, this is the third iteration of opening plans. The first iteration was when the pandemic started and I believe our plan was, um, you know, it was several pages. I want to say it was more than eight or nine pages. The second one came before this school year, which was roughly a little over three pages. This is the third iteration. You can see the um, updated date as February 23rd, which was today. And the, it's now, as I said, two pages. And what you see in yellow is what's being recommended this evening to the board to vote on. Those are the changes from the plan. Some items were no longer relevant, so they've been removed. So I just would like to review those so everyone is aware. Masks for students and staff. Any student or staff member has the option to wear a mask in a school setting. This would take a place, if this is voted in, this would take place on Monday, February 28th would be the first day that this would be in place in Berlin Public Schools. Transportation. Masks are required when students are riding district buses and vans, which are public transportation, fall under federal guidelines. So even if it moves forward that masks are not no longer required in school, it becomes optional, it is not an option on bus transportation. That is a federal mandate. It's clearly outlined by the state. The state does not override that mandate. So masks will still be required if your students ride the bus. Um, assigned seating may be required in the bus and vans. It may be. At this point, we're not, we're not planning to require it. But if it's deemed necessary, we always have that option to do that. Um, so that's with transportation. Social distancing in classrooms. Students should, when practical and feasible, sit at least three feet apart. That hasn't changed from before. Practical and feasible, we recognize that's not always the case. Cohorting, returning to normal use of areas such as cafeteria, gyms, and art rooms. This was already in place. So as I review the rest of the plan, if it's not in yellow, it has not changed from what initially was in place at the beginning of the year. So I'm not going to spend the time to read through every part. It's on the website. You have that there. Um, if this gets voted on tonight, this will be posted immediately tomorrow morning. 
It'll be on the website. You also will receive an email with a copy of this and some few other guidelines. Um, on the second page here, um, one part that I want to highlight here, there's nothing, there's one part in yellow, uh, school events and activities. School-wide events may be modified to allow for social distancing and mitigation practice. I think the key word is may. Um, if we can do it without modification, then we will. If we need to, there may be some modification. We would notify you of those before the event takes place. Um, other than that, everything in the plan is the same as it was as we started the t this school year. Um, the, the, one, just one last thing. The one part that we debated about and we did consult the state with is music. Um, bell covers, distancing, et cetera, they remain in effect. It's what was there presently. There is talk at the state level that that may change, the recommendations may change. And if there is a change, then we may change that policy too. But at this time for music, um, we're, we're keeping what was in place previously. Thank you, Julia. All right, so for the Board of Education, do I have a motion for consideration? The revised 2021-2022 reopening plan as presented. Is there a second? Second. So the motion by Adam, the second by Tim. Now I'm going to open it up for discussion. So we'll have Superintendent Benigni stay there. And board members, you can go ahead and ask any questions that you would like. question just more of a comment um, I you know first of all I know this has not been a, a popular uh, issue with regard to masks in schools um, it was a decision made at the state level and we were abiding by that and we, we follow the rules and, and the guidance that's provided to protect the safety of our students as, our, as well as our teachers I think at this point um, I think that teachers are ready to see their students and students are ready to see their teachers for the, probably the first time for a lot of people um, and though it was a nuisance, it was a necessary nuisance at the time, but I think based on the science, based on the numbers uh, at the state level, um, I'm very comfortable making it a mask optional. Um, I know lots of people will be rejoicing. I, I did express one, one story that my middle schooler will kill me for saying, but she prefers the mask because she has braces on and she thinks the mask kind of covers it up. Um, but for the most part, I think that uh, uh, most others are ready to get rid of the mask. So um, I'm in full support of it based on the, 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 the science, the data, and the information from the state. Thank you, Adam. I'm just going to ask a question that I anticipate, anticipate may be asked. Um, just for clarification, I know you stated it and it's highlighted in yellow on the revised plan, but it does say masks are required when students are riding district buses and vans which are public transportation and fall under federal guidelines, there's no possibility that we have any jurisdiction over revising that, correct? We have no jurisdiction over that. That's been reiterated at the, by the State Department, um, the Commission of Education. Um, we do not have that at this time. It will take the federal government will have to then pass something to allow that not to be a requirement. They'd have to pass legislation to Thank remove you. it. And another point of clarification, if you could explain, because I know there's been some talk out there about this is being tied to a vaccination status. Can you elaborate that that is not accurate? Mask optional is for everyone vaccinated or not vaccinated this time. There's no distinction between the two. Um, the question did come up about if you are, do contract COVID and your requ requirement for quarantine is five days, one of the components was that you return to school wearing a mask. That has also been lifted too. You can require, you're required to quarantine for a minimum of five days, but if you need to quarantine longer, that's also expected if you're not feeling well. So um, similar to if you had the flu, right? If you don't feel well after a certain amount of time, you stay out until you feel well enough to return. Anyone else on the board have um, questions or comments? Brian, um, my understanding is that, let me first say that I'm in favor of mask optional, as you know, we've discussed this previously. Um, but my understanding is also is that the Connecticut Department of Education and the Connecticut Department of Health do have the authority to implement a mask mandate 
regionally if necessary based on um, spikes. How is that built into this, just so that I, I understand that? If the State Department of Education determined that mask requirement would be put back in place, they have the authority, the authority has been given by legislation for the State Department of Education to put mask requirements back in place should the metrics require it. Initially, they were putting it back on Board of Educations and superintendents to monitor metrics and decide on individual districts and things. That is, that the case, a case in how we're following it is that if there was an outbreak and it was extremely high, it would be something that would be put in by the State Department of Education. Thank you. Does anyone else have anything? All right, we can move to a vote. Yep, oh, do you have something else? Just the last thing to close is, as I started to say, going from probably 13 to 14 pages reopening plan, going to only two, we're moving in the right direction. So hopefully that sustains itself and, and, and that, you know, when we get to next year, we don't have a reopening plan. Um, so thank you. Thank you for all the work you've done in preparation with this reopening plan and helping the board navigate um, you know, handling this situation. And I do just want to let everyone know that, you know, the board wasn't waiting to release something because, you know, we wanted to withhold it. We wanted to handle board business appropriately as we should publicly. Um, and, and that's our purpose and that's, you know, our duty to all of you. So we had to wait for our meeting this evening. So I'm going to move for a vote. Um, if you guys could just raise your hand um, when it's time so we can make sure we accurately get the numbers. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay, the vote carries 8-0. So starting Monday, we will be mask optional. Until then, uh, for the rest of the week and this evening, you have to wear masks. All right, so the next portion of the meeting before we move to audience <laughs> a citizen, um, we met this evening at 545 to have a budget presentation. Um, the superintendent and I answered questions in regards to the proposed budget. And at this point, we have had a number of meetings with the board um, and we've worked through our budget and there are a number of questions that have been asked and answered. So I am going to, um, just quickly give a quick overview uh, for anyone that was not here, but it will be available on the website. Our, um, yeah, if, if you could put it on the screen, that would be great, Nick. So our proposed budget for 2022-2023 is 50 million, 112,596. It's a 4.7% increase. 3.68% are contractual obligations to make sure that we keep employment whole, especially returning from the pandemic and addressing learning recovery and learning loss. Um, you know, I think some of the goals of our district are to continue to provide a quality education to all students at the standard that Berlin parents, all of you guys here this evening expect. You all moved to this town, you all chose to educate your child in this town, and we wanna continue to provide that. Um, provide all students with an education that prepares them for multiple options and opportunities upon graduation. That starts in pre-K and kindergarten. That doesn't just start in high school. Um, maintain favorable class sizes and adequate co course offerings. That means making sure kindergarten is packed at 25 and having favorable class sizes so your students can learn, develop strong relationships with their friends and their teachers and get the most out of their education. Um, Adequate funding for technology, which we've learned from the pandemic, is necessary in an ongoing commitment for school safety measures. Um, and with that, we are, our contractual obligations are 3.68% of the budget. That is a result of union contracts going to negotiation. The raises are in line with the state. Um, our teacher negotiations came in below the state average. Our non-certified salaries and other raises are in line with um, the town raises. 
We have no new staff added. We added um, a point two for human resources because we're moving that person, well, hope to move them from the town because they're split, so both the town and the district are increasing that position, but we're not adding teachers. We're not adding paraprofessionals. We're, we don't have anything that is um, added and it's contractual obligations. Do you have anything you'd like to add? Just we have one position to be grant funded. It's an internship coordinator for the high school here and uh, we hope to have students out working in internships for the next year and we believe that that's very important. We had it in the budget for this year but because of the funds that were required to pay for the current certified staff and where the budget would be, we were not comfortable putting that position in with the potential of having to cut that uh, for this year. So we decided to fund it during, through the grant. So those are the only two positions that are in the budget um, for next year. And Nick, if you could just go to the next slide real quick just so people can see what I was talking about. That is what we're coming in at. The, if you look at the stacks bar graph, the blue is just our contractual obligations. Above the blue is 0.95%, which is under a half million dollars um, in areas that we're increasing. We're not adding its increases. We've had massive inflation. Um, but, you know, it is important as a board of education that we continue to advocate for the educational needs of all the students in our town. Um, and again, parents do have choice to send their kids to correct schools, Berlin has to pay, and there is an increase in tuition. So if we you know, do have to cut, then we will be probably paying more. And that will be um, unfortunate. We've done a lot to keep students here in Berlin and attend Berlin public schools and really maintaining our goals um, to drive the learning <coughs> forward. So at this point, can I entertain a motion? I'll move to adopt the, uh, the Board of Education operating budget for the 2022-2023 year in the amount of $50,122,596. Do we have a second? Second. So motion by Adam, second by Kerry. All right, now I'm gonna open it up to discussion for the board. I know we've had a number of discussions on the record <coughs> about this, so anyone have any questions or comments they would like to add? Does anyone have any issues with the budget? Any, any issues of maybe why they might not support it or concerns that need to be addressed before we move to a vote? Okay, well, we've certainly done our work. Uh, we've spent a lot of time on this. This starts in December for us and carries through. This is one of the biggest parts of our job here. Um, so as we go to a vote, if you could just raise your hand, if you're for it or again. So all those in favor? Aye. Opposed? So the vote carries 8-0. All right, thank you. Did everyone vote? Okay. Yep. Okay. I just couldn't see down that end. All right, so 8-0, nice job, thank you. So we are gonna be sending that off to the town. It will then go to the town, uh, Board of Finance, and then from there, the Town Council. And then we have our budget referendum in April, so I encourage all of you to go out and vote. Um, and that is really important. So, you know, it's important that we do this for the kids. The kids are our future. This is why we sit here. <coughs> so now I'm going to move into the audience of citizen. I understand that there are some topics that could be controversial. Um, that not all are going to agree with. But again, look around. There's a lot of children here tonight. Please make sure you act in a way that you would expect this, the staff and the faculty at the schools to act and, you know, behave. Um, no appropriate or disrespectful conduct shall be permitted at any Board of Education meeting. So even if you disagree with what the person is saying, please do not boo, do not shout out anything. And again, I have no issue this evening. If there is any shouting back and forth or loud disagreement, I'm going to ask you to leave. If you do not leave, I'm going to ask the police to escort you out. If you do not, then, and then there is multiple voices going back and forth, we're gonna clear the room and then carry on business without an audience. So unfortunately, I hate to even have to preface this evening with that. Um, I do think it's important to give everyone the space to talk. It will be two minutes. 
and I read the policy at the start of the meeting, so I think the two minutes is much more favorable than allowing <coughs> three people per topic at three minutes each. So with that, um, there is another sign up down there, so if your name did not make this list, um, you can sign up as the spirit moves you. You can only speak once. If you no longer want to speak because your issues have been addressed, um, you don't have to when I call your name, and I'm going to go top, bottom, top, bottom, and alternate back and forth. Um, so we are going to, and again, if I don't say your last or first name correct, I apologize. I think I know everyone, at least everyone's first or last, so I'm going to do my best. Um, we're going to start with Aurora this evening, so if you want to approach the board and just state your name and address. Aurora Cordeville, 19 Timberwood Road. I live in Berlin, and I'm going to see my. I'm going to yield my two minutes to Sarah Patel. My name is Sarah Patel, 65 Savona Road. I stand here tonight deeply disappointed in the Berlin Board of Education. By dismantling the Equity and Social Justice Committee, you have let down every child of color, every child who identifies as LGBTQIA+, every child who attends school in a wheelchair, and any child who might not fit into your perfect image. I stood before you last summer and shared that my son had experienced racism each year that he has been in the Berlin Public Schools. I would like to expand on that and share specific incidents in the hope that maybe this will have more impact on your understanding the need for this work. He was just five years old when he came home from, with his first self-portrait. It was torn through the face from erasing. When I asked him what happened, he replied, I couldn't find any crayons to match me. I called and offered to purchase a set of multiracial crayons for every classroom. I was told the school has them. They were just forgotten. Next project came home with an empty face. I asked my son why. His response, I was too embarrassed to ask because you have to go get them from a separate room. Also at five, a child called his skin dirty and she stopped her friends from playing with him. At six, he sat on the bus while students chanted about white people taking our country back. At seven, a child on the bus told him their dad said they'd have to move if any more Indian people came to our town. At eight, a child on the playground at recess said to him, I wish it were like Martin Luther King Jr. times where you would be treated bad and people wouldn't believe you because you are brown and I would be treated good because I'm white. I was told that it was a Martin Luther King lesson gone wrong. At nine, another student called him a liar because Kian said he had brown hair and other students insisted that all Indian people have black hair, so he must have black hair. His hair is brown. As a concerned parent, I met with administrators at every level regarding these incidents, and I was assured that Berlin was addressing racism and equity. I give a great deal of credit to Mr. Kitzman. Thank you, sorry, the time is up and I have to stick with And this. I get my two minutes now. No, it's two minutes per person because everyone who signed up, who got their things addressed. I gave a great deal of credit to Mr. Kitzman and Dr. McGurk. They listened to my husband and I, and they promised to do better. Their promises were not empty. I finally felt hope when the Equity and Social Justice Committee was formed. I felt even more hope when I attended the first session. And I realized that the district's commitment to change was real. I was pleasantly surprised by the other members that were present, administrators, teachers, townspeople, parents, business owners, BOE members, yes. town council members, and more. I left that meeting feeling like change was going to come, and I believe that together as a committee and a community, we would make a difference. This year, my son has experienced two, true equity in his classroom for the first time. He was asked by his teacher to teach his classmates about Diwali, the Festival of Lights. The students were so excited. His teacher reached out and we made arrangements so the entire class got to make Rangoli. This was an amazing experience for my son. He felt truly valued and was so excited to share. I cannot emphasize enough what this did for my son's confidence. In his class this year, they also got to learn about the Chinese New Year. This is what equity looks like and feels like. It takes away nothing from others. It only enhances everyone's experience. Sadly, though, this year has been, even though this year has been wonderful my son, for my son, there are other experiences as instances which still prove to me that we need the ESG even now more than ever. 
At a concert this year, I heard a song introduced as an African-American slave song. Not appropriate. In another unfortunate instance, I learned of a young friend who was asked in his class to identify fair and unfair. He understood the assignment well, choosing to color his face, his fair face in white and his unfair face in black. But why was this assignment included at all? This seems too similar to my son's experience with a Martin Luther King Jr. lesson gone wrong. I mentioned the children you are fa fa failing, but I think another group you are failing here is your administrators, faculty, and staff. Thank you. So I'm gonna just clarify the ground rules. I just, first off, I need to make sure everyone is being respectful, whether you agree or disagree with how I'm running the meeting. Because I have no issue this evening with ending the meeting, that's it. We will clear the room and have our own meeting without an audience of citizens. Number two, if, you, if the timer goes off and you want someone else to finish, they can certainly sign up and finish reading your statement. I don't care. But we need to make sure we're respecting the rules. When the timer goes off, your time is done. There's, this is going to be over an hour this evening of hearing from people. Um, and we, we can certainly end it at any time. So I don't want to have to do that. Please be respectful. If you don't get to finish and you want someone else who is not signed up to read to go sign up by all means and they can do it when their name is called. And if you don't like how the meeting is being run and you're talking over it, I'm going to ask you to leave. The next person, I'm going to go to the bottom of the list, Tyler, uh, who lives at Home Crest Drive. I cannot pronounce the last name just because the way it's written. Oh, t hello, Tyler. If you can just state your name and your address. Hi, my name is Tyler Shefflioni, and I live at four, uh, 51 Home Crest Drive. So basically, when I was born, I was born with um, Severe to profound hearing, which I have in both ears, which is bilateral, which I have. So, um, <laughs> so basically, the mask just muffles the sound for me, and like when your mask is off, it's like so much easier for me to hear you. And I also read lips, so it also helps. Like in elementary school, um, they used to do clear masks, like window masks but then that would just muffle the sound more, even though I have a DM system, and it just transfers all the sound to my ears. But even though the masks are to protect us, they kind of bother with my hearing, but it also, like, because if a teacher tells me an, instruct, an instruction to, like, cut this, to me it'll sound like cut something else. And, um, yeah. That was my whole conversation, and enjoy the rest of your night. I can't wait to see your faces. Thank you, Tyler. Thank you so much, Tyler, for having the courage to get up here and talk. That was great. Thank you. Um, Rachel Rochette. <laughs> Rachel Rochette, 61 Ellsworth Boulevard. I had hoped hoped I would be able to speak from a place of knowledge about your views on the topic of equity and social justice. Thank you, Adam, Julia, and Melissa for your responses. To the rest, you either didn't see my email, chose not to respond, or don't want your view to go on record. So unfortunately, this leaves me to speak based on assumptions rather than facts. My guess is that tonight we will hear excuses, blame shifting, and passing the buck, all while trying to placate those who are speaking out. I'm here to tell you that's a bad idea. I think we can all agree that Berlin as a whole is not a diverse town. For the most part, we are a white, middle to upper middle class suburban town where our children experience all authority and role models through the lens of whiteness. White teachers, white coaches, white administrators, white police officers, and white elected officials. This is not a bad thing, it's just a fact. The purpose of education must be to prepare our children for adulthood. As an employee of a Fortune 4 company, I can assure you that when recruiting, and hiring, we are looking for individuals who have a broad understanding of the world around them. There is little to no tolerance for individuals who see the world from one lens only. As leaders, it is your role to establish the policy and guidelines to ensure consistency and effectiveness of curriculum and planning. 
A recent blog by Milk College states, the variety of personal experiences, values, and worldviews that arise from race, ethnicity, gender, gender identity, religious and spiritual beliefs, class, age, color, sexual orientation, disability, immigrant status, and national origin enhance creativity and learning, learning potential. Education works when teachers are empowered to incorporate students' backgrounds and experiences as strengths rather than view them as hurdles to overcome. That is your job. Some of you have quoted MLK recently on this topic. To close, I too am choosing to quote him. In his words, I have almost reached the regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in the strides toward freedom is not white citizen counselors or Ku Klux Klaner, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice. Let's try to prove him wrong. If you won't act, I will continue to speak. For he also stated, our lives begin to Thank end you, today. Rachel. We're gonna move on to Bill U. Um, I don't know how to pronounce the last name, 25 Gateway Drive. If you can just state your first and last name and your address. Uh, last. Uh, yeah, Bill Julius, 25 Gateway Drive. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think any child should have to deal with you know, what your son did. But it's for that reason I'm up here, I'm up here to applaud that you did dismantle those uh, learning for justice standards because they're very divisive. Um, you know, for example, I would, I would take a courageous conversation analogy with the story of uh, a man. Let's say there's a man and a group of people think he's stupid. So, uh, you know, they, they sit the man down and they say to him, you know what, you're stupid. And uh, naturally, the man resists. He denies it. Um, who wouldn't? And uh, ultimately, these people tell the man, look, you, the only way you're going to enlighten yourself and not be stupid is if, is if, is if you admit that you're, that you're stupid, which is really a ridiculous argument. Um, and I don't think these are the types of conversations the children of uh, Berlin Public Schools need to have. So I hope that you... Uh, you know, replace the standards with something that's fair, something that's inclusive. Uh, I totally agree. That no child should ever have to deal with that. Um, again, I, I've mentioned before, uh, there's a uh, different standards called uh, FAIR. It's the Foundation Against Intolerance and Racism. Um, that's all I got. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Next person is Nikki S. Uh, Simbitsky. Okay. Um, do you need my address? Yeah. Okay. 947 Chamberlain Highway, Berlin. Um, I'm scrapping my part about the mass since that's already been handled. So I want to speak regarding the equity committee. I would urge you to keep it disbanded. Our children do not need to be taught equity. They need to be taught equality. They need to learn the words and the teachings of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Dr. King said it best during his I Have a Dream speech when he said, I look to a day when people will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. This equity and social justice initiative puts a magnifying glass on color and causes our children to feel anxiety and fear and makes makes them zero in on the worst in everyone. You cannot fight racism with racism. There is, n there is nothing, this is nothing more than cultural Marxism. We need for our children to learn equality and to focus on humanity and the good in everyone. We need them to celebrate the best in everyone. This equity and social justice initiative does not do that. We need our children to learn about Dr. King and about the civil rights movement. They need to be taught that the history of the United States, about the history of the United States, and about the people who fought so hard to make America what it is. Our children are better served learning cursive and English, science, history, real history, United States history, math, and other academics, and not equity and social justice. This is a harmful initiative, and it should not be allowed to flourish in this town. There are other substitutes for such a committee, and FAIR was mentioned, and I believe that you should strongly consider that. Thank you. Thank you. The next person is Kenga. I can't re pronounce the last name, just the way it's written. It's 87 Cottage Street, East Berlin. Okay, thank you. I'm just gonna cuss your name out. I appreciate that. Uh, Lori, you're up next. To state your name and your address. Lori, can you hear me? No, Lori, we can. Lori Schoenfield, 300 Savage Hill. 
Um, I'd first like to thank the board members who took the time to read and respond to my letters. Thank you, Julia, Adam, Gina, and Melissa. As a retired special education teacher of 33 years and concerned citizen, I'm speaking to exp express my disappointment in the board's decision to dismantle the Equity and Social Justice Committee it is, as it is much needed in our district, however uncomfortable it may be for some of you. It is no longer 1950. Our world has changed significantly. We need to provide our students with the tools and knowledge needed to handle the challenges we face in our diverse, never-changing society. I've heard many parents who feel that racism does not exist in our town and that we don't have a need for teaching equity say, I teach my kids not to see color. That comment in itself validates our need for the ESJ J committee. Teaching our kids to see everyone as the same is not realistic or helpful. You may think that it's well-intentioned, but it's insulting. Saying you don't see color is implying we see you as one of us. It's implying that there is something negative about being something other than white. We know that we all see color. If you were to look out your window in your all-white neighborhood to see an unfamiliar person of color walking down the street, would you not see color? I doubt it. Why would we not want our kids to see people as black, brown, Asian, or Indian and embrace them for their differences as well as their sameness? We all come with different backgrounds, traditions, and customs that should be recognized, shared, and celebrated. I will continue to advocate for our kids and for bringing back the ESJ committee. Let's stop treating our kids like they're too fragile to handle things because some adults may find those things uncomfortable. Our kids deserve better. American writer and activist James Baldwin said, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. Thank you, Lori. I'm gonna go to Mary Catherine LaRose. You can approach and state your name and address. Mary Catherine LaRose, 26 Woodruff Lane in Kensington. Um, the first thing I wanted to address was the um, issue with the um, removing of the mask mandate. The fact that you moved it up ahead of audience of citizens, you may have had good intentions, but I feel that you denied um, the children, many of the children that came tonight, the opportunity to share the impact that the masks have had on them. I think Tyler did a great job, and I don't know how many other children are now going to get up, and I'm sure that there were others that were uh, signed up to speak, so I, I wish you hadn't done that. By taking the mask mandate away, it cannot erase the damage that they have done to the children over the course of the last year and a half. Um, the other thing I wanted to bring up on that is the validity of the claim that the school transportation that's contracted by the Board of Education is public transportation. I would question that with your attorneys, just because other towns are saying that and the state is coming down and saying that to you. Does that mean that I can just get on a bus because it's public transportation? I don't think so. The last thing I wanted to say was I would like you to postpone the, um, the new business part two, the Social Justice and Equity Committee uh, actual dealing with it tonight. This is a huge agenda that you have in front of you. Um, and I would, uh, I think it's really important, and so I think it deserves a night that people are gonna be fresh, and there's going to be more time to reflect on that, because a lot of people, it's been focusing on, obviously, the masks and the damage that they have done to the children. Now that that's gonna be over on Monday, maybe we could focus on this social justice and equity and really look at it and, and see what we need to do with that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Peter Z. I just don't, can't read the last name up here. Sorry. I don't want to mess it up. Just see your address and name. Yeah, it's uh, Peter Zerbozo, 158 Elwood. Uh, <coughs> I just wanted to thank the Board of Ed for allowing everybody to have the opportunity to speak tonight. Um, and I do want to say that I think there is a uh, place for discussion around these issues uh, revolving around equity and social justice. I think tonight is a good example of the possibility of what can happen in that committee. We have a group, <coughs> or we have a auditorium full of people with diametrically opposed ideas on different subject matter, and we're able to coexist in this room and express our opinions in a peaceful, civil manner, despite how much we might disagree. I think it's the job of the Board of Ed to 
create a venue or meeting <clears throat> that can allow for that topic to be discussed in a peaceful and civil manner and allow all seeds to, uh, sides to be expressed. Because I think there's a lot of misunderstanding from both sides. I think the verbiage and, and the vocabulary and what you hear on the news and blah, 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 blah. When in reality, what, what people want to achieve in this community is respect for everyone in all walks of life and to establish that kind of, that kind of respect in the children that we're putting through our school system, regardless of color, creed, political allegiance, uh, disability, so on and so forth. I think the way that the Social Justice Equity Committee was established was haphazard and slipshod, and what we're dealing with today from outrage from the public is a direct result of the way it was instituted, and just as badly, the slipshod way it was potentially dismantled. So I would highly encourage the Board of Education to allow a venue for people and parents to be informed and to communicate with each other in a constructive manner. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm gonna go to Riley Hannafin. Hannafin? I don't wanna mess it up, I'm sorry. Hannafin, just state your name and address. Riley Hannafin, 56 Madison Drive. Me and my peers from McGee who signed this hate wearing masks. It's better to make it a choice than have people suffer. So thank you for making the right choice. Thank you, Riley. I'm gonna to go to Tony Dorito. State your name and address. Tony Dorito, 35 Fabian Drive. I have been involved with others. I have involved with others to help try to help the board move forward with respect to the work of addressing racism and tolerance in our intolerance in our schools and in our community. As I sat down to write this statement, every thought that finally became a sentence was met with another competing thought that caused me to delete the sentence. This went on seemingly forever, each revised sentence becoming more problematic than the previous one that the revision attempted to improve on. There was little I can do to express a thought that I felt would be acceptable to this entire audience. It was a fruitless and frustrating effort. But then I thought about a video I've recently seen about a man whose name is Daryl Davis. Daryl Davis is a blues musician known for his energetic style of boogie-woogie piano. Daryl has frequently played backup for Chuck Berry and Jerry Lee Lewis. Daryl was also a Boy Scout in his earlier years. He tells a story of when, at a young age, he joined an all-white Boy Scout troop in Massachusetts. Some of you know that I am a Scout leader here in our community, so I was very interested in learning more about Daryl. During one of his experiences as a Boy Scout, he was carrying the American flag and marching with his troop in a local parade. He was struck with rocks and bottles thrown from the crowd. This led to the troop leaders forming a protective ring around him. Davis did not understand the incident until he discussed it with his father later that night. The incident led Darrell to a curiosity about the origins and basis for such explicit racist attitudes and later shaped much of his future activity. What many people don't know about Darrell, as an Afro-American, he has engaged with numerous members of the Ku Klux Klan and has convinced a number of them to leave and denounce the KKK. Darrell estimates the number of people he had influence on was about 200 KKK members. There was Thank a you. Sorry, you can't finish. We're gonna stick to the rules tonight. Um, Julianne C. Colazzo? Just state your name and address, please. Uh, Julianne Colazzo, 801 Worthington Ridge. I want to start with the experience I had when educating our son. My husband is Hispanic, so when it came time for our son to enter middle school and later high school, we decided to send him to private school for several reasons. One of the more important reasons was the fact that we wanted him exposed to a more culturally diverse learning community, something that was lacking in Berlin public schools. That was approximately 25 years ago. 
I now ask, have things changed for the better in this regard? From what I observe, not really, and in some respects, it's gotten worse. The recent dismantling of the Equity and Social Justice Committee was extremely troubling. After inquiring what prompted this action, I was told by certain members of the VOE that the issues were too sensitive, too controversial, and too divisive to be addressed within the school walls. Yes, it's true. These conversations are often uncomfortable, messy, and controversial. They require courage and brutal honesty. We never want our children to feel unseen, overlooked, shamed, rejected, or disadvantaged on the basis of their identity. What if it were your child that were confused, depressed, or wanting to talk about their identity? What if it were your child being bullied because of their appearance or a disability? What if it were your child that was a target of a hate crime because of their religion? What if it was your child that was called disparaging names due to their race? Wouldn't you want a knowledgeable and willing adult to help your child? When an individual feels safe and supported within their own identity, their potential is maximized. In order to set the tone of acceptance, leaders and elders in the community need to be willing to pave the way for our youth. The starting point is a willingness to engage in courageous conversations on these issues. Eliminating the Equity and Social Justice Committee is a step in the wrong direction. Sunlight is the best picture. Thank you. At this time, are there, sorry, I have to stick with, I have to be consistent with the rules. Are there any other students on here that want to speak? Because I know it's starting to get later. I think Jackson might be one. Um, I just, in case your parents do want to get you home. Are you, what's your name? Jackson. Yeah, come on up. 8.15, so I know it's a school night. All right, Jackson, just state your name and address. Hi, my name is Jackson. I live at 586 Edgewood Road. I am in fifth grade at Griswold. I came here to fight for no masks, but now I'd thank you for making, ma making it optional. We were made to wear masks during gym, and they made us out of breath. In the hot months after recess, we were only allowed to take them off to drink water. We needed time to breathe. For the last two years, we cannot understand each other, but now, that, but now we'll have the chance. It will make learning easier. Most important, thank you for letting me see my friends' faces again. Thank you, Jackson. We will not be offended if you guys get up and go home, but you can stay, <laughs> but I'm just saying, because I know it's a school night. <laughs> um, are there any other students on the list that have signed up? All right, I'm gonna keep going. Um, we will go to Joanne Stetson. Joanne Angelico Stetson, 188 Stony Mill Lane. As a resident and former representative of this predominantly white community, I was eager to serve on the Equity and Social Justice Committee and immediately reached out when I learned of it. Those of us who understood and embraced the goals of the committee realized or quickly learned that the work would be uncomfortable at times, and some of us would feel vulnerable in confronting our own unconscious inherent racism and implicit bias, which we all possess to some extent. Despite our discomfort, we knew how crucial it was that we have deeply transparent conversations and respectful discourse to facilitate profound change, benefiting our students, staff, administrative, and community, most certainly in Berlin, considering its history of disturbing racial incidents. I was stunned when I watched the unilateral dismantling of the committee based upon thin, thinly veiled excuses for acquiescing to a faction touting a political agenda. Rather than take a stance in support of the committee's work, the board submitted to the pressure of a select few, citing the issues were too controversial and divisive. Instead of supporting the integrity of the committee and its goals, which are unifying in mere concept, it empowered a small group fueled by ignorance and fear. I am deeply concerned the message conveyed by the board's actions is that if you bully enough, intimidate, and spew enough misinformation and rhetoric, you get your way. And that's a heck of a lesson to our kids. I'm so grateful I was raised in a home where supporting and advocating for others and defending against bullies was the norm, and grateful to have passed those lessons on to my children and grandchildren in the hopes of creating a more equitable and just world. The general principle of the ESJ committee was learn, then advise. Instead, the committee was censored and then silenced. 
And to make matters worse, there's been hollow excuses and zero accountability. There is a very tense majority of immensely concerned parents and citizens who are confused and outraged by the board's motivation and decision. I am one of many, and we will persist in our efforts to reinstate this committee. Thank you. I'm gonna call Chris Barlow next. We're, we're a family. We do have a joint statement that would take. Did, she, did you sign up as she well? Did, she did as well. What's your name? Okay, Quiet so Price. once his two minutes is up, you'll take it and then well, start. I, can I yield my time to him so he can finish, or do I need to pick up where he leaves off? I'm, um, once his two minutes is up, if you want to finish his, that's more. fine. Then you'll that's get yours. Right. So, so four minutes total, but we'll do two, and then you can yes. state your name okay. and address because I see you're both signed up. So, just Thank state you. your name and address. Hi, my name is Chris. Actually, can I move? This? I'm sorry, I don't remember who was here before, but I think they're, yeah, they're shorter can, than I you am. Yeah, you can do what you gotta do. <laughs> Hi, my name is Chris Barlow. I live at 15 Overhill Drive here in, here in Berlin. Uh, my family and I bought a home a couple years ago. And we were thrilled to find a house in a nice neighborhood close to major highways with a well-regarded school system. The building is magnificent and I'm looking forward to spending a little bit more time here once my eighth grade son starts this fall. As a black family, fully aware that we were moving to a predominantly white town after having lived in New Britain and Middletown, we were keenly aware that we'd be a minority, but we didn't start to realize what the climate was like until here, we were here about a year. We love the school system, especially since our son has special needs. Faculty and administrators have been nothing but helpful and welcoming. And while effectively nonverbal, our son has had his usual effect of positively influencing everyone that came around him. His mother and I didn't really start to realize the racial climate was like in town until one October morning in 2020, while on a walk in our neighborhood, we saw a black-faced doll created by Berlin up predominantly displayed in front of Walgreens. We both did a double take and asked ourselves, did we really just see what we thought you just saw? We took a picture and sent an email to the superintendent and director of Upbeat. Mr. Benigni apologized and had the display removed immediately. He then invited us to join the newly formed Social Justice and Equity Committee. We were both encouraged by this, Nice to see that the town embraces multiculturalism and is concerned about bias, insensitivity, and racism. The committee was great until it wasn't. Then despite being inaugural members of this group, we heard rumors that it was being disbanded. We started talking with others in town and came across numerous innuendos about Berlin. We learned that in 2019, Berlin's police commissioner was replaced after being caught using racial slurs and reporting that he had trained his officers to use deadly force against African Americans. Tales have circulated about apprehension in neighboring high schools, not wanting to face Berlin High in athletics due to colorful language directed at opposing players that read straight out of an episode of Apple TV's hit show, Swagger. Thank you so much. Thank you. Can you just state your name and address? Twanette Price. And Nick, can you restart the timer? 15 Overhill Drive. And then you can just go a few extra seconds because I know you were taking over for him, so. Sure, it, it, it won't take that long. Okay. Um, this winter's second grade concert featured a Negro slave song called Closet Key about a, <laughs> a slave children the songwriter called Darkies in the note fearing punishment from their master. These rumors and documented incidents do not paint Berlin in a positive light and affect its reputation as the Urban Dictionary's most racist town in Connecticut. Rumors travel, and we've heard from members of our own group that Berlin High School students who go on to CCSU have been pulled aside for directing colorful language at fellow students. Some faculty feel these students are ill-prepared for life outside, <coughs> excuse me, outside of town where uh, the world's more diverse. We are here as a group of residents who want to do something about it. <clears throat> We're here today following the advice of an ancient African proverb, if you want to go quickly, go alone. If you want to go far, go further, go together. Our friends are <clears throat> walking this journey with us are al and already making an impact. Our grassroots movement is growing. We love to have the Board of Education involved <clears throat> and reinstate the Social Justice and Equity Committee. While we understand the prevailing political pressure the board is under, we had hoped that, <clears throat> excuse me, <laughs> they'd stand on principle and not bow to pressure. You started this committee. Please don't let it crumble because things got a little harder. The, if the kids and coaches on Swagger can overcome the challenge, so can you. 
Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go to Jessica next. Jess Patroff, 420 Lower Lane. Um, since masks are handled, I just want to say Jackson, Tyler, Riley, you guys get to see your friends' smiling faces and no longer struggle to breathe. So happy for you guys. We've been fighting hard for you. Um, so now that that's handled, um, I'd like to see um, through Willard, um, I'm not sure what control you guys have of this, but I'd like to see volunteers welcome in all grade levels, not pick and choose which grade levels volunteers are allowed. I'm allowed in my kindergartner's class, not in my second graders, which causes issues in my home. Um, I'd also like to see us focus on the school's environment. Um, what's the culture inside these buildings? Teachers, parents, staff, students, all feeling defeated. Um, we've been through two years of misery. It's time to get our schools back to life as we knew it. Um, we need to take down these um, shields during um, snacks um, and lunch times. It's more like a prison visit and enough with the reprimanding the kids for turning around and talking to their peers behind them because they don't have a shield or a mask. It really needs to end. Um, also, um, super excited for Willard. Um, I think it's the 28th. They get to dress as their favorite characters and we get to see their smiling faces as well as their costumes. Super pumped for that. Um, and now, let's see. Um, Equity Committee, I'm very sorry to hear that some of your children have been through some things that truly nobody should have to deal with. Um, as of right now, I would personally rather see our schools get back to life as we knew it. I think that this is something that shouldn't be handled at the current moment. I definitely think that once our schools are back to life as we knew it, this is something that should come back on the table. And I believe that no matter um, your race, your gender, your um, culture, that everybody should be treated equally. Thank you. I'm gonna go to Evelisa next. Good evening, Evelisa Mayette, 178 Lower Lane. Um, I am a teacher here at Berlin High School, but I also grew up in Berlin, went through the school system, as did my husband, um, as did our children. So when we look around our classrooms and the greater Berlin community, we see a changing landscape and an increased need for educators to learn about culturally responsive practices. We know that the population we serve has broadened over time, and we must increase our capacity to ensure that every child in our community succeeds and thrives, not just some children and not even most children, but every child. This is our legal and moral obligation. The learning and discussion initiated through a committee like the ESJ committee serves only as a means to improve outcomes for all. There should not be a political discussion, but a chance for us to value, include, and celebrate every child in our care. We know that a stagnant system a system that fails to respond to the needs of every student in our care is a system that fails to thrive overall. We wish for no student to feel less than or to feel undervalued. We wish every person to feel they contribute to our community. I think everybody should be able to agree with that. This push towards educating ourselves and having difficult conversations about race, identity, and inclusion are not isolated to our district, but reflect a commitment in neighboring districts across the state to this work. Ensuring that students feel a part of their school community, no matter their background, race, religious affiliation, or identity, improves school and civic pride, increases standardized test scores, and helps every student to be more well-rounded and engaged individuals. These outcomes mean a stronger, more successful Berlin. The success of our community depends on our partnership toward common goals, yours and all of ours. We want our students to leave the Berlin education system as productive members of a global community. The work of a committee like ESJ is a means to that goal. When we value, support, nurture, and celebrate every child and make efforts to expand inclusivity throughout our district. Thank you, Avalisa. I'm gonna go to Lisa um, B. Wilcox. I'm just not sure how to pronounce the last name, so I don't wanna mess it up. Lisa here. 
What? Lisa, who lives at Wilcox Ave, Boudreaux, maybe? No? Okay. Um, then we are going to go to Barbara. Is Barbara here? Yeah. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Barbara Sparkowski. I live at 15 Fairview Place. I want to say thank you for taking these masks off our children. It's been rough. It's been a rough one. Um, because of that, I would have hoped to, I hope you guys can, in this increase in our budget, find some way for some counseling, some bring in some extracurricular types of things to get these kids through this because they've already started and I appreciate Mrs. Theroyce. She's been amazing ever since you've brought her in. Please keep her. Um, they had talks today about not bullying kids who take them off, don't take them off. Super excited that started because that's a big concern for all of us as well. Um, I don't know if, there were, if you guys finished the rest of my email after my mass grant, but bullying is a problem. I have two little white boys and my little white boys have been bullied for six years. Well, my older one now going on six years. Kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade, all sorts of reasons. Um, his friends now are in counseling for wanting to kill themselves for, you know, these are very harsh truths that we're going through, we're living right now. We don't need to complicate it with race. They've already, it's there. Kids are not being nice to kids. Doesn't matter what the hell your race is. They can't be nice to little white boys. They can't be nice to each other. This is a problem. It's a problem in Berlin. It's probably a problem everywhere. I come from a school where our white population four minutes away is only 15% in their schools. It was a problem then, it's a problem now. I really hope we can put some focus on it and not have to drag other reasons into it. I'm experiencing the bullying just the same. I, I don't have to hide behind a color, I live it. So there's lots of parents who are living this and I'm, I'm not looking to be treated special, but we need to really get a grasp on this with our kids especially coming out of the last two years. Thank you. Thank you. Cornell, you're up next. State Cornell Boudria, next. 115 Skinner Road. I'm here tonight to express my support of equity and social justice, not just as an initiative of the BOE, but as the moral basis to realize what Representative John Lewis dedicated his life to, the beloved community. It's an ideal Berlin should strive for. It's the rising tide lifting all boats that President Kennedy challenged us to achieve. It's shocking that the committee was dismantled. It's my hope the committee will be reseated in a timely and transparent fashion. And I've heard comments from many members of the board suggesting this work is better suited outside the BOE. That's a matter of debate. What other institution is better suited to educate students as inclusive leaders and lifelong learners than the school system. The unfortunate reality of outsourcing ESJ or removing it altogether is that it seeds the moral ground for the comfortable ground. It's an admission the board prefers the tough work of equity and social justice to be taken up by others because the board is incapable of bringing justice onto itself. It gives fear a seat at the table while mindfulness and inclusion are considered disposable and inconvenient. If ever there was a lesson to teach students, this is a case study in what not to do. And I'll just close with an MLK phrase that he seems to be pretty popular around here these days. The time is always right to do right. Thank you, Cornell. Sarah Mortensen. Fifty-six Madison Drive. I was going to talk about masks, but thank you for voting the right way where everyone should get a choice. I just want to say proud of my daughter Riley, Tyler, and Jackson who left. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go to Julie Erickson. Good evening, Julie Erickson, 85 Hickory Hill Road. I'm here tonight to express my concerns about the dismantling of the Social Justice and Equity Committee. First, I'd like to thank all the board members for your service. As a for former Board of Ed member myself, I've been at that table for nine years. There are often difficult decisions and hot topics that make us feel uneasy. 
it has been said by many members of the board that the topic of social justice and equity is making the board divisive and polarizing. What that really means is that the topic is making you feel uncomfortable. Squashing the committee is just an excuse to avoid tension. One of the things we need to do as board members is to educate ourselves. And if you haven't done so already, I would suggest that board members attend a diversity, equity, and inclusion training. Becoming knowledgeable about what DEI really is and recognizing your own unconscious bias is an important part of the process and first step. Teaching diversity, equity, and inclusion to students helps to instill moral and social traits that will support their growth throughout their younger years and into adult life. By teaching these topics, each student has access in a safe place to challenge, discuss, explore, and form their values and opinions. And education is a civil right, and any child who does not feel safe coming to school is being denied their civil right. As a board member, you have an obligation to dismantle systems of oppression that prevent children from accessing a great public education because of their race, gender, sexual orientation, culture, disability, or nationality. Your obligation is for each and every student. Thank you. I'm gonna to go to Corey Whiteside. Hi folks. Hey, thanks for, uh, for providing this forum tonight. And uh, I do also wanna jump on the bandwagon for thanking for the early decision and the emails about masking, that was, a, that, that, that was definitely, um, that was on my mind as well. But I'm here to talk about the Equity and Social Justice Committee. Uh, I did write a letter or an email expressing uh, my support for uh, some, some form of work in this area. I think there is space in this community and on this board uh, to, to discuss ways that the curriculum can be reflective of some of the principles that we, that we do agree on. Uh, in my letter, um, you know, my, on these principles, I think that it's, it's most important that it should partner, this committee should partner with parents and, and in the most transparent way possible. I think that somebody else also referred to perhaps the reason why it became a divisive issue was because of the way it was formed. There were some perceptions about it. There was some, uh, uh, there, there wasn't transparency in, uh, in, in all situations, I think. So uh, I do think that uh, if you're gonna reform it, it needs to have a very, very tight focus that is outcome-based, and it should use, uh, it, it should work toward non-divisive standards applied to the learning environment that counter racism and all forms of intolerance with an emphasis on fairness, understanding, and a common humanity. We want a pro-human approach and not a divisive color-based lens applied to everything. It should work toward promoting pro-human values in the classroom so students can learn in a welcoming, inclusive, non-divisive school environment. That's also, I'm hearing a lot of this, uh, the reaction talking about promoting division or division being a, a, a byproduct. So I believe the committee should be reauthorized. I very much hope that Thank you. Sorry, you can't finish. We gotta stay consistent with the rules this evening. Um, Alan, Alan V. Lower Lane. Oh, that's so true. Yeah, bad at reading last names. I gotta shrink Seat your name in address. Alan Verastro. 535 Lower Lane, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, the board is already aware of my position on the matter of social justice. I've e emailed you all a few times. We've had some discussions. Um, I just want to say that the, the proposed action items I didn't have much of an issue with and, and, and the concepts of having a committee to, to address um, injustices in the community is commendable. Uh, my issue is with the methods and the resources proposed. That is what I found divisive and corrosive. Uh, it's very counterproductive to, the, to having equality and unity in our community. 
Uh, before the board votes to proceed, I would sincerely urge the members to thoroughly review the Learning for Justice programs and ask yourself, is this really the best path forward? If you were buying a house, you'd buy the, would you buy the first one the realtor showed you? Probably not, uh, but this is the only thing that was presented to you. I think there's better options that fit our community better. Um, a lot of what I hear, uh, also there's a time and a place. I don't know if the children, especially kindergarten, is where we want to start with this. Some of the problems sound like they're more with the adults in this community, so maybe it's something that should be more public. Um, and uh, so I just ask you to consider other options. Thank you. Thank you. Kirsten. What? It's Kirsten. Oh, you're all set? Okay, great. And then there was one other person on the list that didn't come up, Lisa Boudres. Is there anyone else I would like to address the board? You can go on up and state your name and address for the record. John Patra, Lower Lane. I would what like to. Wait, sorry, what number, Lower Lane? 420. Okay. I would like to start by saying that we all want the same thing for our kids being a safe, undivided, respectful place to learn. Having said that, I do not agree with the Learning for Justice curriculum. There are more inclusive programs to choose from. I would like to ask the board to consider another program one that includes everyone in one group instead of separating people into groups. This is the very thing Dr. Martin Luther King fought against. So again, I would like to ask, please consider a different program. Thank you. Thank you. Before we wrap up this section, is there anyone else I would like to address the board who hasn't already? Okay, we're going to move on. Thank you everyone who spoke and thank you everyone for being respectful of one another with differing <laughs> opinions this evening. Um, I really appreciate it. We're moving on to the next item, personnel. We have a retirement of a science teacher at Berlin High School. I'm gonna turn it over to Superintendent Benigni to say a few words. Yes. Dave Del Judas. Um, Longtime science teacher for Berlin High School has announced his retirement of late. Dave has been a fantastic asset to Berlin Public Schools over the years, making a huge impact on a science department as well as the relationships he's established with students. Um, Dave will be um, surely missed um, by all of the faculty, but more so by the students that he's connected with over and over again since his tenure. We wish Dave great happiness in his retirement. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have a motion for consideration? I move to accept the retirement of David Del Judas, teacher of science at Berlin High School, effective June 30th, 2022. Also to thank him for his, eight, uh, for his 38 years of service. He has provided the youth of Berlin and wish him good health and happiness in his retirement years. Do we have a second? Second. So motion by Adam, second by Carrie. Is there any discussion? Just, just one yep, go ahead. Mr. Del Judas is an outstanding teacher. I had him as a student, and sadly, I think he's kind of the last of a generation of teachers that I knew. Thinking of Mr. Warburton and, and, and the, uh, Del Judas, I mean, there was just a great crew of, uh, of teachers uh, back in the day. I'm dating myself, but excellent, excellent person, and uh, he'll be sorely missed. You're getting old. Yes. <laughs> you graduated ahead of me. I did. <laughs> Anyone else? All right, well, we wish him well in retirement. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay, the vote carries 8-0. Moving on to the consent agenda. Do we have a motion for consideration? I move to approve the consent agenda as presented. So motion by Adam, do we have a second? S second by Melissa. Um, all, any discussion about the consent agenda? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, 8 0. Julian, you're the president of Oh, sure. I wasn't here for two of those. Okay, yes. So it's going to be seven in favor, one abstention. Thank you. Moving too quick. 
Um, I'm gonna move to the next part of the Equity and Social Justice Committee. I am going to clear up a few misconceptions that are here. Um, so the first off, this was not a board decision to dismantle it. Um, as the chair, I made that decision. I had to make that decision um, at the time. And I'm going to explain exactly what that decision was and why it was made and why it was necessary at the time. So I'm going to read to you what I read at the meeting um, when I did that, just for consistency. So first off, this committee was put in by the former board chair without a vote, so it can be removed without a vote. For anyone questioning how it was done, uh, why there was no board discussion about it, um, and I don't think it's fair for the board to be taking the fall for that when I made that decision as the board chair. Number two, um, with something this important to the community, we had an hour of audience of citizen. We need to hear from all sides. If this committee was not dismantled, we probably would not have heard from the other side. This has been going on since August. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. We kept putting this on the agenda and we could not move with it. So I could not continue to run these meetings. And I will also state that sitting in this chair has been almost an imp impossible role. Of the six years I've been on the Board of Ed, the past seven months has been almost more than my full-time job and my part-time job combined. Um, it has taken precedent over my family, my one-and-a-half-year-old son, and I still continue to put it forward, and I still continue to navigate the challenges, and I still continue to try and best solve the problems. However, we need to hear from all people in the community and not just a subgroup, and without making a call like that, we, we wouldn't have heard from that many people. So I would like to address the recommendation I made to dismantle the Social Justice and Equity Committee. I recommended that the advisory committee be dismantled. That word was chosen intentionally. It was not dissolved, it was not disbanded, it was dismantled. This word was used intentionally because if you dismantle, you can mantle it back together. So I also stated that this would be included in this agenda item, and all I was doing was restating. The board is more than welcome to say their piece. Um, but like I said in previous meetings, we as a board, we need the opportunity to come together and have honest and open discussion with one another. We are a new board and we need to be able to build trust amongst us and have open dialogue without getting screamed at and yelled at and being at constant attack and criticism. This job has been harder than any other position I've ever had in my life. And sometimes I question why am I doing this for the community when they treat us so poorly. However, we need to come together as a board, determine next steps, and then come together as a community. So we opened it up for everyone to talk. We will discuss as a board in a retreat setting where we can talk amongst one another and determine the next steps for this committee. And we, we want to do what's right and best for our community. But some of this is above our pay grade here. We're not social justice and equity experts. We're just trying to do what's best. I'm so happy to see other elected officials are here this evening because as we move forward with this committee in whatever form it takes, it's going to have to encompass the whole community and not just a small section of the Board of Ed. We want to do things well. We want to run a good board, a strong board, what's right and best for all the children. But, you know, we can't keep going back to the drawing board and not accomplishing anything. So at this time, we are going to have a board retreat. We have one on the calendar. I am hoping that we have the opportunity as a board to really discuss, build that dialogue, build that trust amongst us, and really come back and report with a thoughtful, purposeful direction of this committee. Uh, we know it's important and we know the work has to get done in what capacity. I don't have the answer right now, but you know, I just wanted to share that out. Um, I will open it up to the board or the superintendent if they would like to add any comments.
Um, for, first of all, I, I appreciate the opportunity to, to have a, a, a retreat because I think that for one thing, being a new council, I don't think I've talked to people on that side of the table uh, since the beginning. This has been a very difficult time even just to communicate as a board, uh, not what we're used to. Um, that being said, I think that, you know, uh, the, the equity and social justice uh, a committee needs to be addressed, whether it's a, a larger group, uh, more community-based with representatives of each uh, area. I've talked to some of you that, that spoke this evening, um, and uh, my own personal opinion, I have not shared it with anyone else, was just if we did something to have, you know, somebody from the council, somebody from the police department, somebody from the Chamber of Commerce, from Kiwanis, the Lions Club, I mean, really make it a, a larger group that's more representative of the town. Um, that being said, uh, I, I think that 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 is one issue. There's something else that I've mentioned previously as well to a number of you is I think that uh, uh, as a board we need to also uh, pay close attention to the mental health of our students right now, which is uh, suffering coming out of the pandemic. I think it's a, it's a, a major priority. Um, you know, some will say it's because of masks, some will say it's because of the pandemic. It's, we have a number of things going on right now that we need to step back, reevaluate, and try to address these issues as best we can in, in, in the most uh, collegiate way. Um, in, in coming together, because I think that, without a doubt, everybody in this room wants to do what's best for the kids um, and what's best for the community. Uh, most of us have, have grown up in this town and loved this town, chose to, to raise our own children here. And I don't like to see divisiveness. I don't like to see yelling or disagreements. I mean, but there's got to be middle ground. We can't put our head in the sand and say it's not an issue. I think it is an issue. But how do we address it? In what method and what model? That is something that we're, we're going to have to dig into a little more for, for, for the sake of this new board, understanding that a lot of us came in or a lot of people came in in the middle of COVID trying to deal with virtual learning, how to get the technology in place, what are the rules going to be like if we're bringing, uh, bringing students back in, the, the plexiglass, the PPE, the funding from the state, the funding from the federal government. There's been a lot going on. This has not been a normal year. So I, I do say be a little patient. I think we've got a lot going on right now, but it is not something that's going to be forgotten, but I think it's something that needs to be addressed. And hopefully through a retreat atmosphere, we can have this discussion in a broader base and then uh, bring something that back that's going to be uh, equitable for, for all as well. Thank you, Adam. Anyone else on the board like to add their two cents? Yeah, I will. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, I think, you know, obviously something that Adam just said um, really resonates for me, given my profession. Um, mental health among children has been following a pretty steep trajectory of um, an increased proliferation of, of significant mental health issues, and that was on the rise prior to the pandemic, but the pandemic has really um, exacerbated that considerably, catapulted it. Um, so I do think it's of, of great concern. I think a number of issues obviously contribute to that. I think a lot of adults are struggling with um, living in um, very challenging times where there's a, a convergence of very um, significant challenging issues. And I think um, to echo some of what you have shared, Adam, and what you have shared, Julie, the ways to come to, um, um, to improved mental health, improved well-being, improved community well-being um, is through connection and conversation and um, inviting one another um, into conversations, right? We um, can only come to higher ground if we uh, help each other there. So um, having members of our community, members of our um, of other boards within town, but also just members of our larger community, a community of which, um, you know, we all, that we all share and of which we're all a part, um, come together and uh, not only be willing to share their opinions, but be willing to listen to others' opinions is of vital importance in advancing um, anything that we do. Thank you. In reflecting on the work of the committee, I think the important aspect is the committee was supposed to have a greater impact beyond itself. And to hear many of you speak tonight, the committee was important to have that impact also on our students. But in, in being part of the committee, and I apologize for my time not when I was not in the district um, when the committee started, 
being part of several of the meetings and things, and then talking to citizens in the community, talking to former board members that were on the committee, what was occurring within the committee was not even building consensus amongst those on the committee. And I think that we may be in a new place after hearing from this evening of it being greater than just the Board of Ed, and that people now have a greater commitment to um, making a difference for students, for the community, and beyond. Not to say that the people didn't have that commitment to start, but I'm not quite sure that the commitment was actually cultivated at a level where people felt that the committee was moving forward in, in, in the correct manner. And what I mean by that is, as Julia said, several times things were brought to the board, several things were brought forward, speaking to many members on the community, on the various subcommittees, how the committees met, how those things were brought forward, the involvement level, how much was being brought forward, what the expectations were, and not to make excuses, but trying to put a committee of this nature together in the middle of a pandemic when you can't meet in person is also a difficult task too. So I hope that all of you will give the board and myself a chance to reevaluate where we are, what is tangible, what, what we can move forward with in a way to make a difference and, and, not, and not just say we're doing something and not actually have meaning. I, I go back to the work that we did for a number of years, and I know it's not the same, but it does have some of those overlaps, lapping traits in the work with habits of the mind, the kind, compassionate, considerate, those values that we want everyone to have. I know that the equity and social justice is bigger, but the foundational pieces were there. They were supported across the community. They were supported with our students. And I really believe that this work has to have that commonality and it needs more support than just one side or the other side. There needs to be a concerted effort of the whole. And those that are on the committee have to be the first step in building what should be moving forward. Not that it's the national standards here, not that it's fair, but there has to be consensus on the committee that this is the right direction that we're moving. So um, I, I appreciate everyone's comments this evening. I definitely appreciate those that did volunteer their time for the committee, and I don't want them to feel that it was wasted. Thank you. Anyone else on the board like to <coughs> add their remarks? <coughs> okay, so that addressed that. We're going to move on to um, facilities related update. Mr. Kugner, do you have an update for the board? Good evening, board members um, and all our guests. Um, my name is Jeff Kugno. I'm the director of operations. My job is to give a facilities report. Uh, I was taking some notes today to, to uh, put the most current things down, and I realized that we finally got to a point where a lot of things we've been talking about for a number of months are, are ready to go forward. So we've got some happy things to talk about here tonight. I'll make it as quick as I can. Um, I'm going to kind of go by when they're going to happen. Uh, in March, which of course is pretty quick, uh, we're going to start the stage lighting project over at McGee, which I know the principal has been looking for for a long time, as some of the other teachers. We wanted to do a much bigger project at McGee, and we will get to it at some point for the whole auditorium, but the town has decided to start funding piece by piece, and that's better than not, so we're going to start the stage um, lighting project with about $25,000 of uh, seed money from the town. That's this coming month. Uh, in the April break, uh, three of the projects we've been talking about for a while, Griswold Band Room, which is about $20,000, the Hubbard Student Storage uh, Facility um, uh, Cabinet Work, which is about $65,000, going to start in April break, and the Hubbard Skylight, which I know people are going to be a lot happy about, including myself, uh, which the town put some money up for, uh, is going to be done. So all those three projects will be completed in the April break. Um, in summer of 2022, we have th three projects at McGee. One, the one we spoke about a while ago, which is the uh, uh, in the Library Media Center, the lighting project, which was started last year, put together, estimated, uh, bid, uh, designed, and uh, that's worth about $185,000. Uh, that's going to go forward in the summer. Uh, McGee Computer Infrastructure is going to start at about $300,000, and McGee Health Suite which is a relatively new project, 
Um, that's going to start with some grant money. It's going out to bid uh, very shortly. Design is just about completed. And that's about $120,000 worth of uh, ASSER grant money. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is one we've heard about for a while, and that's the Willard HVAC system. I'm sure you all remember that the town is going to be going out for money or using grant money to do the HVAC system. It's a very expensive project for all the elementary schools. Um, it's estimated somewhere between 2.8 million and probably 5 million per school. Um, good news is um, it's not going to happen this summer. I'm being fictitious. Uh, they're not going to be able to start it this summer, so everybody that's been asking me on whether we can still use McGee uh, for all the summer school, the YMCA, and a number of other things that happen in the summer at McGee. It's a very busy place. It seems by the best information I have that we'll still, have, we'll still be able to do that at McGee this summer. Good reasons for that. Uh, there's a lot of things still to do in the HVAC uh, process, which includes the funding. However, this Monday night, uh, the town is uh, trying to move ahead the appropriation uh, uh, from the ARP funding to be able to fund that project and start as soon as we can. So the appropriation will be in the March 1st. The plans and specs are all complete on the project. The next thing I understand as of today that they're going to do uh, is to put on an RFP for a construction manager. The reason they're doing that is that they want a private construction manager, construction company come in to run that project. It's going to be a complicated one. It's going to be a large project. Uh, and so therefore, they'll be going out with an RFP. Uh, to pick up, sure, a very, very good um, construction manager. Uh, they'll get proposals from a number of pretty, probably pretty sizable firms and choose one within the next couple of months. Uh, after that, that construction manager's role is to do a cost estimate on the project so they know they can have enough money to fund it and also, very importantly, to do a schedule. Schedule is very important for us at the Board of Ed and the public schools because, of course, they will close down uh, Willard the following summer. So in 2023, I don't think we're going to depend upon Willard being open for any of those uh, activities they do in the summer, which means we will we'll be planning for and working for um, having, those pro having those programs put in one of our other schools. Um, so it takes some time to, to, to make those plans. Um, the schedule will probably be using the all of 2023, and depending on when the manager gets on, depending on what we can do earlier, if possible, when design and everything else. Um, they're going to see if they can do some stuff in the fall, some in the summer, and the rest in the spring. I don't believe it's going to be just a six-month, excuse me, a six-week project, and that's all we have in the summer, as you know, because the rest of the time we're, we're occupied with school. So it's going to take a while. But the good news is, as far as projects go, it's all going the way it should. We've, we've got the funding procured. We've got the design done. We're going to have professionals in there doing the work, and now we've got to get a cost estimate schedule. So that's, that's the news on what's going to happen in the next you know, almost year and a half of projects we have on the books. As I said, we've been thinking about these projects for a while. Uh, they're, all going to, they're all doing very, very well in the process, and a lot of them will be done by the summer. Do you have any questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the report. I'm going to turn it over now to Superintendent Benigni to um, report out on Open Choice Program participation for 2022-2023. Thank you. Currently, we have, uh, for next year, we're projected to have 93 students returning from the Open Choice Program. I am requesting that we accept 20 Open Choice seats. The likelihood that we will have 20 students um, and fill all those seats. Last year, we did not fill all of the seats. Um, I am concerned only because of where the budget. If we were not, if we do fill those 20 seats and all 93 students do return next year, we do have students that opt out of the choice program. Typically, the only reason that they opt out is they move out of Hartford, so they no longer become eligible um, to attend the Berlin Public Schools. That would give us 113 um, choice students um, in the Berlin Public Schools for the next school year. Um, that puts us roughly at 4.25%. If we do not maintain the 4%, our um, amount of funding that we receive from the state drops by $2,000 per student. So we're looking at a $200,000 deficit if our numbers do not maintain that. So right now the students would be recommended that we have 10 students at the K level 
I divided up four students at Griswold, two at Hubbard, and four at Emma Willard Hart. When you declare the seats, you need to declare what school they'd be at also. And then in first grade, we'd have four at Hubbard and six at um, Emma Willard Hart, so a total of 10 if all students, all seats were filled. The only other thing that would give us additional seats is if the students have siblings that are in other grades, typically when we can, we will accept them. We don't guarantee it, but we will accept them, meaning if a student had a sibling in fifth grade, we would take that sibling that's in K and in, in fifth. Um, so that's the seat declaration that I'm asking for for the 22-23 school year. It would be 20 seats. Before we open it up to discussion, do we have a motion for consideration? recommendation regarding the level of participation in the open choice program for the 2022-2023 school year as presented. Do we have a second? Second. So the motion by Carrie, second by Adam. Now we can open it up for discussion. Thank you for reporting that out. Um, does anyone have any questions, comments, concerns, reasons they may not want to support this? Me, sure. Uh, Brian, right now we have 105 students enrolled. Is that, am I reading this chart correctly? Right now we have 105, which as of today, it was reduced by two because two students withdrew. So we have. So it's 103. Yes. And so if we're at 103, that means 10 are graduating out essentially. If we, if, well, I'll just use the term graduating out. Yes. Okay. I just want to make sure I understand how this, this was put together. Make sure I'm correct. Yes. Could you also address the misconception that's floating out there that by accepting the students, we are now creating positions and adding classes? Because I know this comes up every single time. So when we accept the students, as I spoke, we have to designate what school they'll be attending. And then those students will be dispersed. So right now, we have four attending Griswold at the K level of kindergarten. So we would, might put all of them, one in each different classroom. So it would not mean an additional teacher. It means if there was 17, they now have 18 in those, in those four classrooms. So we would add one additional student to them. That's why they're dispersed amongst the, the three different schools. And looking at the numbers for Griswold going from K to one, it seemed more pertinent to put the students at Willard and Hubbard, both four and six. And that's how we've done in the past. And the other model is that we don't offer seats in the higher grade levels. We try to take as many as we can at K and one. Um, in some years, we've only, tried, we've only needed to accept 10 students, and we try to do the K level first. But this year, being that we need 20, we thought that it, we have greater likelihood of filling the seats by doing K in first. Thank you. Thanks for that clarification. Anyone else on the board have any questions or comments, concerns? You guys good? Yeah, this is pretty consistent. I actually, sorry, it took us a while. Yep, no, <coughs> I was fine. pulling up the history of our enrollment since like 2016. So I was seeing the consistency. So this is keeping up with the same consistency. We, we try to stay a little over 4%, <coughs> usually 4.3, 4.4. Um, but sometimes we come in right at four. This year, I think we were 4.09. Um, so in one year, we were like 3.98, right? right? 3.98, and the state went around it to four that year, even though, right. you know, so a couple hundreds. Anything else from the board? Yeah, I just want to um, make a couple comments because I um, will not forget a presentation that was offered by a number of students who um, are identified as open choice students, come from Hartford. Um, and it was such an incredibly moving um, presentation um, because they spoke about the positive experiences that they did have in the Berlin Public Schools. And, and really, um, I wish we didn't have to kind of differentiate between who is an open choice student and who is a Berlin student and that they, we would just refer to them all as Berlin students because I think they do feel, um, and I hope um, that they feel that they are all Berlin students. I also think it's important to recognize that there's a value add in having people um, come to Berlin Public Schools to be Berlin students um, that doesn't translate into dollars and cents. Um, so 
I just want to add that <laughs> as a comment, um, especially after some of tonight's comments. Well, I think I think important comment is not to refer to, and we don't suggest to refer to as open choice students. We have students as a regional school district could have. We have students that reside in Hartford. We have students that reside in Berlin. Right. I think it's important to refer to that, but I do think it's important to think about the number that we're accepting and the importance of being a number is that those and the monies are tied right to our budget and, and staffing and so on. So um, not maintaining a 4% of choice students could you know, lead us to a $200,000 deficit in the budget. I think it's important to, I, let me just say, I think it's important to highlight that fact. I just also want to extend that conversation to include the value added because Absolutely. people are a part of our community. No, we, we try every other year to do that um, interview with the students and share it with you. So yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. Um, we will move to a vote. All those in favor? Aye. Is there anyone opposed? Okay. The v vote is 8-0, thank you. And now we are going to move to our next agenda item, the discussion of the graduation site for 2022. Um, and I'll turn it over to Superintendent Benigni. So principal use has put together two options for you in the packet. Option number one um, is that on Friday, June 10th at 5.30 p.m. start, uh, we would have graduation at Sage Park outdoor on the football field as we did in the past year. Um, it's important that we're offering these two options because Wealthy Hall is not available or hasn't been. It may have changed, but it, when we checked, they were not renting this year yet. So the rain date would be if there's inclement weather, should the weather, and then we'd have the rain date on Saturday um, with an 11.30 start, which would be in um, the gymnasium here at the high school using the A gym. The capacity is about 1,500 students. We'd use the auditorium to hold an additional 600, and they would stream the graduation ceremony here. That's option one. Um, a weather call will be made no later than two o'clock on that Friday to notify families that we'd, so we could set up appropriate weather emergency administrative personnel would also assist in making the decision. That's option one. Any questions about option one? It's pretty easy. Option two would be Friday at 5.30 still, rain or shine. Does not mean that we would be outside at um, Sage Park. If it's inclement weather, we could move, we'd move indoors at 5.30. So we'd be planning, if this is inclement, we'd have to plan two setups for, for the um, graduation. One would be set up inside, one would be outside if there was a chance of inclement weather. Same day, allowing families all night grad accordingly. So. Option two could cost more as far as a setup if need be, and some more logistical issues to deal with, but it will would allow for all like grad to happen as it has in the past. So in speaking to Principal Eustace, she wanted to provide you with both options. We'll let the board decide which option they feel is, um, would be, I guess, more appeasing to the parents uh, for graduation, I guess is the best way to put it. Oh, God. Um, Principal Eustace is here, so if you have questions, uh, we had a dialogue about our thoughts, and if you'd like to talk to Eileen, by all means, you can have Eileen come up. So I know we should probably make the motion and second it before we open it up for discussion, but I will say I am slightly reluctant to make a decision right here and now based on what has happened in the past, <laughs> but um, with graduation, um, before we open it up and ask, Eileen Eustace, any questions? Do we have a motion for consideration? I move to hold the commencement for the class of uh, 2022 at Sage Park. Do we have a second? Second. So the motion by Adam and second by Harry. Now we can open it up for discussion. So I will uh, turn it over to the board. I'll let you guys take the lead on this one. Go ahead, Adam. Um, uh, I know just because my wife is on the calls for the all-night grad party, um, and that is going to be, that's pretty much locked in for that Friday, correct? The thought of the seniors coming back from an all-night grad party, turning around, getting home at, I don't know, 7 or 8 a.m., and then going to graduation, I don't think is, is really going to work. Um, I personally would be in favor of uh, option two, uh, keep it for Friday. 
let people plan accordingly for relatives coming into town um, and uh, you know hope for hope for good weather and if, if there isn't then at least it's still on that day all night grad party continues on that evening and uh, we, we move on thanks Adam I don't want to be the only one. No, I agree. I think the option locking in the same date and we have two, lo two solutions to keep it on the same day makes the most sense. What's the consensus of like everyone else, like the teachers and you, and would you prefer one or the other? Ideally, it's nice to just know the day and the ballpark of time. So if you have inclement weather, we could adjust the time accordingly. So like if we know showers are going to come through right at 530, we might say we're going to push start time to 630. OK, and let the showers go through, get everything dried off and let people come. Um, so. I will say it, it's a little bit more of a challenge to get people to work because you're now asking them to commit potentially for two days and things like that. The bottom line is we'll make it work. We're, we're, we're going to be there no matter what. Um, so I think, um, you know, we, we really can make either option work. There, there is, as far as the setup um, for same day, it really doesn't matter whether you decide Friday or, you know, option one or option two, because you're still going to make a weather call on Saturday as well. So really the only, you'd come inside if it's, if it's inclement weather, dangerous weather. I've, I have done this at some other schools that I've worked in. And honestly, sometimes we've even been out there in a little bit of mist because people would much rather be outside and be together versus coming inside, but I will say at least our inside option, um, although it may not be completely ideal, we have a beautiful gymnasium, it's air conditioned, there's plenty of seating. Don't keep in mind too, we'll also have seating on the floor for the graduates, we'll set up a small staging area, just like what we would do outside. And if uh, we would also be able to then have overflow seating in here should we need it and be able to simulcast right in here. So I think we would be able to actually, I know we'd be able to accommodate just as many people indoors as we would outdoors. If you recall last year, we didn't have that option because of the pandemic. We had no option whatsoever to come inside. So that's a little bit of a difference um, for this year. But um, again, I think if you, if you set the day and the time, it really, if you think about family planning, people have family coming into town, they're planning family celebrations and dinners and things like that. Um, things the next day and you definitely have the all-night grad party to consi consider because there's a lot of time and planning that goes in and they don't have any flexibility. So if we moved it to Saturday, all-night grad would still be Friday night. Thank you. Thanks. Lindsay, do you have any thoughts down there? I don't mean to put you on the spot, but oh, you wow, are graduating Lindsay, this year. I'm sorry, you guys have been <laughs> quiet all night with option two just because of what Mr. Salinas said I agree the all-night grad is kind of important to the seniors and I think it would make the most sense to know that that would be after our graduation so okay and then what about um, Gina or Matt I know you guys or Tim have had your children graduate from oh and Tracy I'm sorry <laughs> any any of the parents who have had to so I mean Julia realistically if you go back to the pitchforks and torches the last time we brought this up a number of years ago is you know that I was in favor of actually having graduation in town um, at that point um, <coughs> it seems to me that we don't necessarily have an option for where it's just when and honestly any graduation celebration is exactly a celebration the kids are just as excited to walk across the stage whether it's at sage park or wealthy hall wealthy hall is not available so um yeah i see that it's it's more expensive for us to do it at sage park but that's okay thank you Anyone else? So it sounds like the second option appears to be best. So we set the date and we stick with the date. Does anyone oppose 
that option. I just want to ask, I'm assuming that you will go back to Welty Hall after 2020, you know, they said the fall of 2022, so will it just resume back to Welty Hall after 2022, this it's fall, for next year, the 2023? I think once that option becomes available, it would come back to the board and the board would need to make a decision on that. I think last year, the response from the graduation, though we had no choice, that people, it was a beautiful day, enjoyed being outside. It may not be the case this year if it's not a beautiful day, but I think it would come back to the board when Wealthy becomes an option and then we would make that decision at that point. You know, in the past we've done, you know, surveys and things to see where people feel about graduation, maybe that's something that the board directs us to do prior, but it would come back to the board to set the graduation date and the, and the location. Any yeah. other questions? So we're, are we going with option two? Just to like, because I know option people are already option. asking and it'll be, that, that'll be great news to share. Yes. Okay. All right, excellent. We have to change the motion, right? Sage Park, I think. Okay. Option one versus option two is up to you. Okay, cool. We prefer to, but you do what you want. So we can move to a vote. All those in favor? Uh, aye. aye. Opposed? Eight zero. Um, and then there is last item, almost the last item, um, policy review and revision. There is first reading. Um, Shipman and Goodwin has recommend recommended revisions to a number of policies and bylaws noted in the summary sheet posted in Schoology. So I will turn it over to either Superintendent Benigni or Tim, who chairs this ad hoc committee. Um, and just to share about it, there's no action that needs to be taken on this item this evening. And if any other board member would like to chime in, by all means. I mean, typically we don't. It's a first reading, the, the notes are there, the policies are in Schoology. A lot of it is just legal updates. Uh, I think a lot of it was pronoun neutralization as well. Um, a couple of interesting ones that were in there related to bylaws and board meetings and roll call votes going forward, um, things like that. So just different things to take a look at as we go forward but nothing major in terms of difference. None of them are new. They're all just updated revisions. So it's not as though you're having a new policy. It's just whatever changes, either because of legislation they felt the policy needed to change or because of the times, it just was time to update it. I guess if, as, as we've done in the past, if people have questions, they should route them through you, yep. uh, Julia. Yep and we will get those answered. And then the second reading and adoption will take place at the March 14th meeting. So certainly if you have questions beforehand, send them to me and I will do my best to get um, answers sent out to the whole board. Um, and if there's anything that comes up that night, we will certainly have a discussion. Um, but, you know, if there is anything that, you know, we may not have the answer to that night. I, I would really appreciate hearing about it beforehand so we can do the appropriate research and get an accurate answer. Um, so thank you for that. Any, anything else in regards to the policy review? First reading. All right, one last item on the agenda. Do we have a second? So motion by Adam, second by Carrie. Yep. Scott said it before, Melissa. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? 8-0-9-22. We have adjourned the meeting. Thank you, everyone, for a great meeting. And thank you to all the members of the community who came out and spoke.